Thanks, Bradley. Good morning to all of you. It's great to be here. Um, I got to say this uh, conference for me is a little bit um, intimidating. I'm not as smart as all of you and uh, certainly not as experienced as all of you, but uh, when I was invited to come, I called some of my sports uh, executive buddies and asked them about uh, whether this topic would be of interest, and they, they, said, uh, they said they thought it might be, a, might be fun. And, and if you had to summarize what I'm going to talk about, it might be that great Yogi Berra line, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there actually is. So <clears throat> that's what we'll talk about today. As a setup, I'll uh, remind you of a, of a play you all probably remember, especially if you live in the Boston area. November 15th, 2009, Patriots are playing the Indianapolis Colts. Very late in the game, a little over two minutes left. Patriots have the ball on their own, 28-yard line, fourth and two. Call timeout. I think the announcers and most people were speculating they would come back out, try to get them to, uh, the Colts to jump off sides, and then probably punt the ball. But instead, they go for it on fourth and two. And as you all passed to Kevin Falk, and he was uh, stopped short of the 30. It seemed like a bad spot to me, but that's okay. So it stopped short of the 30. And uh, they turn the ball over. Uh, of course, the Colts go on to score and win the game uh, 35 to 34. Well, uh, you can imagine what happened uh, in the wake of this. Uh, there, was, there were a number of press reports saying how foolish this decision was. In particular, I, I love this guy's, this, this guy's quote, so I'll just read this to you in its entirety because it's probably hard to read. This is great, though. This is, the, this is how the guy opens his article about the, the play. Fourth and jackass. Uh, that's our name now for the infam uh, infamous play by the New England Patriots. Uh, each and every week we see bad coaching decisions in the NFL, but never, and I mean never, have I seen one as dumb as the decision the Patriots coach Bill Belichick made Sunday night against the Indianapolis Colts. His brain was more frozen than Ted Williams. Um, now, it's an interesting question to ask. By the way, from an analytical point of view, as many of you probably know, that was a proper decision. It wasn't a great decision. It wasn't like a, it was probably a 55-45 decision. So, proper thing to do at the end of the game, but, but not, a, you know, not a, an obviously great question. But here's the question I would pose to you. If you were the coach, or even a part of the uh, staff of, of that team, you know, what would you do next time when you're in that situation, fourth and two? And um, how would you feel about reading that kind of thing about you? So what I'd like to talk about today are really three things quickly. One, one I want to talk about why luck is actually more important than sports outcomes today than it has been in the past. Second, I want to talk specifically why our minds are so bad at understanding luck. And then finally, I want to talk about how this misunderstanding of luck can lead to um, decisions that are very suboptimal, both uh, in the front office and on the field. And then certainly if we have a few moments for Q&A, I'd be uh, really happy to do that. So let me start with uh, a continuum. I call this the luck skill continuum. Uh, and you can just imagine it's pretty self-explanatory. On the far left would be activities that are pure luck, no skill. On the far right, pure skill, no luck. It's worth taking just a moment to define terms here. I'm going to define skill right out of the dictionary as the ability to use one knowledge, uh, one's knowledge readily and effectively in execution or performance. So you know how to do something, and when I ask you to do it, you can do it uh, basically on cue. Luck is obviously much more difficult to define. Um, it's actually a very hot area, debated area in the world of philosophy, but I'm going to say luck exists when three conditions are in place. Number one, it occurs to an, for an individual and organization, so we can specify uh, where it actually operates. Second is it can be good or bad, and I don't want to suggest that it's symmetrically good or bad, but it can be good or bad. And then finally, and importantly, it's reasonable to expect a different outcome could have occurred. It's reasonable to expect a different outcome occurred. So those are the three things. Now, by the way, there's a very uh, elegant test to ask if there's any skill in an activity, and that is ask if you can lose on purpose. If you can lose on purpose, there must be some skill in that activity. Uh, Bradley mentioned I work in the world of investing. Investing is kind of interesting because it's actually hard to win on purpose, but it's actually hard to lose on purpose as well, which tells you pretty quickly where uh, the world of investing is on that continuum. <laughs> <coughs> Now, you might want to visualize this. Uh, statistically, you guys are all good at this. So you might want to visualize on the far left-hand side would be a di a two distributions combined. So on the far left, it would be just a luck distribution, and, and the skill distribution would be all zeros. You're drawing from a zero jar. On the far right-hand would be a skill distribution, differential skill, and then you'd be drawing zeros from the luck jar, right? And here I've arrayed, by, by the way, uh, sports. These are based on one full season of that sport, <clears throat> where they are in the skill luck continuum. So that's the NBA. Barclays Premier League Soccer, Major League Baseball, NFL, and the NHL. So based on one season's performance. Now there's an interesting idea that comes out of this. Um, 
especially when you think about those two distributions, which um, I call the paradox of skill. It's not an idea I came up with. Uh, but the paradox of skill says that when skill increases, and more accurately, when the differential skill decreases, when skill increases, luck becomes more important to determine the outcome. Now, I did learn about this from a series of essays by Stephen Jay Gould, many of who you know. He's a, he was an eminent biologist at Harvard who also wrote, wrote a lot about evolutionary theory, but loved to write about baseball. And in particular, this essay he wrote about Ted Williams caught my eye. And he posed the question, why has no one hit four, over 400 since Ted Williams did that? <coughs> in 1941, 70 years. And he says, you know, maybe it's because the guys play at night, you know, maybe it's because uh, <coughs> relief pitchers or the gloves are different. None of those things actually checked out. <coughs> it turns out the reason no one's hit over 400 is because skill has become more uniform. So the difference between the very best players and the average players and the average players and the worst players has gotten vastly narrow. The standard deviation of skill is narrowed. So to be more uh, precise about this, the standard deviation of batting average, so if luck stays the same, smaller standard deviation of skill means smaller standard deviation of batting average. So to be more specific, in 1931, the standard deviation of batting average was 0 .032, <coughs> and now more recently it's 0 .028. So to say this all very differently from a statistical point of view, Ted Williams in 1941 was a four standard deviation event. That got him to 406. If you were a four standard deviation in 2011, you would have hit 380. Now 380 is obviously awesome, but it doesn't get you over that threshold of 400. So this is the idea of paradox of skill. As skill improves, the differential skill becomes narrower, and if luck stays the same, luck becomes more important in determining outcome. So the point here is that in the last few decades, we are, in, we are operating in a world that has become more and more dictated by the outcomes uh, for, by, by luck. <coughs> now, uh, I'll just draw your attention to two features of this picture. By the way, the top is, uh, there are two, two things I'll, I'll uh, mention. One is the distance from the average to the right wall of human performance of physiological limits is now narrower than it was before. So everybody's getting better, absolutely. And second is the slope of the right-hand side of the tail has gotten steeper. <coughs> that would imply clustering, right? People are closer to one another in terms of their performance. So the paradox of skill makes actually a very specific prediction, which is in realms where there is no luck at all, you should see two things happening. Number one is you should see a grinding towards that human physiological limit. And second, you should see clustering of performance, and that is all the top finishers are getting closer to one another. <coughs> I could have illustrated this many different ways, but here I chose uh, Olympic men's marathon times from 1932 through 2012. So the white line is the time of the guy who won the gold medal, and if you look at that, that's the absolute performance improvement. And the guy who won in 2012 in, in London ran 23 and a half minutes faster than the guy who ran uh, in 1932. So if you're a runner, it's about a minute a mile. That's a pretty good pickup of the clip, uh, even over 80 years. But the real thing I want to draw your attention to is the lighter blue line, which is the difference between the guy who came in first <coughs> and the guy who came in 20th. And as you can see, in 1932, that was about 39 minutes. So the guy won the gold medals, you know, taking a shower, he's eating a sandwich, and this other guy's still running across the finish line, right? <coughs> that time is down now to seven and a half minutes, and you can be pretty sure if we check in 10 years or 20, 12 years from now, it's going to be an even narrower time. By the way, this is true for anything where you're measured against the clock, uh, sprinting, any kind of racing, crew races, all that kind of stuff. You, and if you've seen, by the way, even the evolution of the clock has to go out more digits just to capture uh, the closer finishes between the various players. So this is this important idea of uh, the paradox of skill. Now let me turn as a consequence of setting this up is here's the core problem. Uh, the core problem is in in fields where their outcomes occur <coughs> with some probability, that is some combination of skill and luck, it's absolutely essential to focus on the process uh, and the process by which the decisions are made rather than the outcomes. And the reason you do that, of course, is because good process ultimately leads to good outcome. Now there's a matrix I love on this, it was developed by Jay Russo and Paul Shoemaker. And uh, so the, the rows are the quality of the process and the columns are the outcomes, right? So if you have a good process and a good outcome, that's deserved success. Awesome, good process and bad outcome, that's a bad break, right? Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and make that decision again the next time, just as you did before. Bad process, good outcome, <coughs> by the way, which is also, uh, that's the area people get caught, um, is dumb luck. <coughs> You're just lucky to have done well in that particular instance, and of course, bad process, bad outcome, and that's poetic justice, <laughs> that's what's supposed to happen. <coughs> So um, this leads to the key idea that I really want to emphasize today is this notion of outcome bias. 
And uh, I want to share with you the results of a very famous exper experiment in outcome bias that just really highlight this point. So I'm just taking a moment to make sure I, I explain this clearly. So the subjects are presented um, with, with a set of facts. They say, we went to decision makers and allowed them to choose between two choices. One was 100% chance of getting $200 or an 80% chance of getting $300. Okay, so that is the information the decision makers had. And by the way, it was, it was you know, fair bet. It was true, 80% was truly 80% and so forth. Okay? So that's the extent of the information of the decision maker. And you might think in your mind, what, what would you personally choose? Now the subjects were brought in and they said, okay, we're going to just tell you that the decision maker chose the gamble. They chose the 80% of $300, right? Which is a higher expected value. <clears throat> now the question is, now they've, to they've told that, would having the outcome revealed change the subject's judgment of the quality of the decision? So would knowing the outcome change how they perceive the quality of the decision? So here you can see the results. If, in fact, they were told that they won the bet, so they won the $300, the 80% sh showed up, they've rated that bet, uh, the, the quality of that decision as a 7.5. So the scale is from, zero to thir uh, from negative 30 to positive 30, so this is a positive 7.5. If they were told that they, the 20% showed up and they made no money whatsoever, they rated that decision as a negative 6.5. So there's a huge difference in the perceived quality of the decision based solely on the outcome without any weight on the actual decision itself. And this, I want to say, is absolutely pervasive. People constantly judge qualities of decisions based on outcomes when it's probabilistic, when they should be focusing almost exclusively on process. And this, by the way, is extremely difficult to avoid. <clears throat> so this is basically the heart of my discussion today, is why does this happen? <clears throat> why do we do this? And what I want to argue is it's hardwired in all of us. And the way we uh, neuroscientists have come to understand this is through some fascinating experiments with split-brain patients. Now, these are people uh, who typically have very severe epilepsy and hence very severe um, seizures. And they get to the point where there's really nothing they can do besides sever the corpus callosum, the, the bundle of nerves between their uh, hemispheres of their brain. That, by the way, tends to work very, very well. What it also does is sets up an extraordinary experimental condition where scientists can feed information to either the left or right hemisphere and then figure out what's processing what kind of information. Now, as you all probably know, your right hemisphere is very literal, has basically no language capabilities and your left hemisphere is basically where most of your language uh, resides. It is also much more, uh, kind of goes with stories and themes versus literal facts. So it turns out, scientists have determined that there's part of your left hemisphere they call the interpreter. And here's what basically happens. I give you some sort of stimulus, right, some sort of effect, and this part of your brain will automatically, seamlessly, rapidly create a narrative that fits that outcome. And then you'll take that narrative and you'll put it into your mental file and it goes, it goes back. Now the key is the interpreter knows nothing about luck. The interpreter's all about cause and effect. All about causality. And by the way, it evolved obviously in a very different environment where causality probably was much more legitimate. So let me give an example. <clears throat> they might have the patient sitting there and the uh, doctor standing, sitting in front of them stone-faced. Then they present some, uh, like a joke or something funny to the right hemisphere, right? The left hemisphere doesn't know what's going on, but the person starts to laugh. Then they say, why are you laughing? Now, the doctor's sitting there stone-faced, and the left hemisphere doesn't know anything about the joke. It'll just say, doctor, you're a very funny guy. For instance, it creates a story, narrative, very, very rapidly. So this, by the way, you see everywhere. Uh, one example I'll give you to be concrete is the financial crisis. Uh, there's a professor here at MIT named Andrew Lowe who studied 20 accounts of the financial crisis, you know, 10 from academics, 10 from journalists, and it uh, turns out there are no common themes. Everybody just has their own story, their own narrative to explain what actually happened. So this is the thing I want to leave you with is you've got this little module in your brain that's constantly making up causes for every effect that you see. Sometimes it's real and legitimate, often it's completely made up. And that is why we have such a very difficult time dealing with the, the issue of luck. Now, related to this is that as humans, 
and also tied to your interpreter, we love stories and we struggle with statistics. And many of you probably see this in your own day jobs. We love stories and we struggle with statistics. Let me just tell you one experiment, about one experiment <coughs> that really uh, makes this point clearly. So this is uh, in the world of medicine, and they say to people, you've got, this, you've got a horrible disease with the following really unpleasant symptoms, right? Not good. They say, now you have two treatment alternatives. You can always pick 50-50, right? So no matter what, you can always go to a coin toss cure. Then they gave people a second choice, and it was either 30, 50, 70, or 90% effectiveness. And one of those numbers paired with an anecdote, positive, negative, or neutral. And that anecdote was about somebody just like you. Right, so I hope I'm making myself clear. So you might be getting 30% neutral, you're getting 70% positive, right? So everybody's getting a different combination. And the question is, when you're presented with a base rate and, or a story, which is gonna be more salient in your decision making? Now these are real world subjects, right? Now take a look, I just I highlighted the extreme results. So in the case where you have a positive anecdote, positive anecdote, People pick the 30%. Now, again, 30% versus 50%, you can always default to. They pick the 30% 8 out of 10 times. If it's a negative anecdote, you see that they pick the 90% effectiveness. So, again, 90% effectiveness versus 50, they pick the 90 only 4 out of 10 times. 6 out of 10 times, they're going to the default. The message here is the stories swamp the base rates. They swamp the statistics. Why? Because your interpreter attaches to the story. It's a narrative. It makes sense. Much easier for people to digest and reflect on. So this, I think, is the key issue about why we struggle so much with the issue of luck. Uh, stories often carry the day. So let me wrap up with this. You know, how does this manifest in the world of sports? It's everywhere, of course, but how does it manifest in the world of sports? Well, one example, of course, would be we tend to overweight recent results because of outcome bias. So, for example, uh, we tend to think hot players will continue to be hot. We think cold players will be, continue to be cold. And perhaps some of the most egregious examples is players come off, older players come off really good seasons. They have the opportunity typically to sign, for example, long-term contracts at, at uh, prices that are probably uneconomic from, uh, or, or much higher than their, their true worth. Um, the baseball guys get that one. Okay, number two is uh, we re rely too much on perception as we go through things. Um, there's, a, there's a great professor, uh, a, a psychologist actually, but does a lot of work on forecasting decisions at the University of Pennsylvania named Phil Tetlock. And he talks about the three phases of decision making. Phase one is you're just using stories and uh, your intuitions and your perceptions. Phase two is you swing the complete opposite way and you use solely base rates. And that's some of the things, by the way, the sabermetrics community has been accused of. Phase three, though, and I think this is where we all like would be, is that you intelligently balance these two things, phase one and, we've, one and two, right? So you, in other words, you understand the base rates, but you can shade them as appropriate to make proper decisions. So this is a problem still, is that we're, many people are stuck in phase one. They're relying on their per perceptions to make decisions, uh, whereas they should be much more attuned to the base rates. The third and final thing, of course, is that we tend to be risk averse in our choices. Again, this is in the front office as well as decisions on any field. There's a very important concept in psychology, many of you know about this, called loss aversion, which suggests that we suffer losses of comparable size twice as much as we enjoy the similar size gain. So if you lose a dollar and you gain a dollar, you suffer twice as much from losing a dollar as you enjoy gaining the dollar. It's asymmetric. Um, that's, by the way, not supposed to be true in the world of economics, but it truly is in terms of people's behaviors. So as a consequence, when you think about your day-to-day -day decisions, uh, people are going to shy away from those loss of or those decisions that can cause them losses or pain, and they're going to try to focus on the safe, what they perceive to be uh, the safer course or one where they won't be criticized. So with that, I'll stop. Um, you know, there are the three points I'm hopeful that I was able to convey today. Number one is that luck is actually more important today in the outcomes in sports because differential skill has narrowed. And I guess I should make a point of emphasis. I've, I've written a number of like blog entries, and I often get um, I get flamed by commenters. Uh, what I, I what I don't want to what I don't want to leave with the impression is that skill itself has not improved. Skill absolutely, but it's not absolute skill we're interested in. It's relative skill. It's the distribution of skill is the key idea here, and the distribution of skill is narrowed in almost every every sport that we observe. 
The second point, which is really the key, the crux of this discussion today, is that our minds are very poor at understanding the contribution of, of luck. Uh, and we're just not wired to do so. Now, many people here may live in this world, but when you go out into the real world, this is a very, very big challenge for lots of people. So even if you have the numbers and the background and analytics on your side, uh, conveying that and, and persuading somebody can be very difficult. And then finally, this lack of understanding leads to some very predictable and I would argue persistent mistakes in how we make decisions. And this is certainly in the world of sports and uh, in the world beyond. So with that, let me uh, stop. And I, I think, Bradley, if, I don't know if we have a few right, minutes. Right we, have, we have a few minutes for a couple we questions. Do have, so we're, uh, we do have time for questions. So yeah, Awesome. Hi. In um, discussing the decision-making process under luck and skill, all those experiments that you showed, including that little graph you had about luck and skill, the parameterization of the underlying distribution is known. Now, most of these, even the Belichick story is, uh, you have to estimate the mean and the standard deviations in the distribution. So, can you comment on how that affects your, <coughs> your takeaways on that? Yeah, big time. So, you know, the world, and, and tell, me if, tell me if this doesn't jibe with sort of your own experience. I think that in the world of sports, you get more of that opportunity than you do in other realms of life, right? So, so in the, you're in the, okay, right, so the investment industry is much more difficult. Um, so, um, there, uh, so in this book, The Success Equation, which Br Bradley mentioned, I have a whole chapter dedicated to the shape of luck, and your point's exactly right. And so, so the, the, I'll, I'll just make the point I make on skill, which is common sense, is in almost every realm, skill follows an arc, right? So physical activity, sports, you get better, some peak age, and then you, okay, so everybody knows that. Luck, uh, I think that the key things are, the, the defining line I like to talk about is our events that are independent versus ones that are not independent. And, and so if, if I read, so, so a lot of stuff in sports, it's not perfectly independent, you know, so batting average is not in, perfectly independent. But for all intents and purposes, that gets you pretty close to where you want to go. When you have social processes in place, right, so there's a path-dependent process and there's a memory, it's a very different set of mechanisms. So I go through those in the book, those mechanisms, but you're exactly right. There's an inherent lack of predictability and there's also uh, often a, a, a winner-take-all type of effect, a lack of inequality at the end of the process. So you're exactly right. So those are, and I want to be clear, that is true. So uh, we, were, we were sticking with sports today because we, we do understand the parameters typically better, but, but you're absolutely right. It's a good observation. Fair observation. You have a question over there? Uh, as far as an organization is concerned in sports, uh, all things being equal, the skills are equal, does, how does culture affect the end result? Uh, so for example, I think in basketball you look at, say for example, the Miami Heat or San Antonio Spurs, they have a very strong culture and much has been written about that. Does that culture, uh, in a sense, almost account for luck, all things being equal? So, <clears throat> well, you know, there are other people who have done a lot more work on this, and i got to say that, uh, and I've not spent a lot of time thinking about this, uh, but I'm, of, uh, I'm kind of of two minds on this, because on the one hand, uh, I, I sort of feel it myself as an athlete and as a um, guy who works at a company, but on the other hand, I'm not sure how easy it is to sort out from the actual statistics on this, right? So in other words, the interesting question I've always asked, and I've asked a lot of uh, sports executives, you know, is does culture or chemistry precede winning or does it follow winning? Like which is first and which is second kind of thing. And I'm not sure that I know what that, that is. Now that said, um, uh, two things. One is I don't think that that creates luck, by the way. Uh, by the way, I, I say this in the beginning of the book. There are tons of aphorisms about luck. You know, luck is where success meets opportunity. And you know, my, I, I'm, I'm lucky, the harder I prepare, the more lucky I get. <coughs> Those are all, uh, they have very important positive sentiments of which I certainly agree with, but they're not by my definition, which I gave earlier, they don't actually, they're not actually luck. If it's something that's in your control, it's not gonna be luck. It's only things that are outs outside your control that are gonna be ultimately luck. So what I do like, by the way, which I think gets to your question to, to a little bit closer to your question is, I do think that there are systems that, uh, so or organizational systems that work better than other systems. I think the Patriots here in Boston are just a great example of that. I think that, you know, the, the system is more important than any individual participant in the system. And if you bind to the system, it tends to, to do well. But it, it isn't about, any, well, maybe it's about one or two individuals, but for the most part, it's guys doing their jobs within the system leading to success. So 
I'm, I'm a little bit, you can see, I'm a little bit of two minds on that. Um, I think people, I think people talk more about and make more of it than it's actually actually there about that because of that causality thing. But I do think syst some systems work better than others and make more sense than others for sure. Yeah. Oh, back here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I think we've made a lot of progress in understanding, you know, why Belichick maybe should have gone for it on fourth and two there, um, applying these lessons from behavioral economics, behavioral finance. So my question, I guess, is can we take the next step or should we take the next step to apply those lessons to the fan experience? Um, you know, everyone in the management seminar today said wins was not the ultimate criteria when they're running their organization. It's, it's the, Kraft said it was the community. Um, there's more than just wins. There's dollars and cents. There's how your fans will feel. Then there's also winning. That's a, maybe the primary component, but not the only one. So it, might there be a sense in which going for fourth and two there uh, might be the right thing to do if you're a coach, but the wrong thing to do from an organization standpoint. Yeah. Because the fans are going to have twice the pain. <laughs> exactly. The exactly. You know, that's just such a fascinating question. And um, I've been actually working on that topic in a different realm, which is, a corp you know, for example, what is the purpose of a corporation? And so what is the purpose of a, you know, what is the purpose of the New England Patriots, right? And I think that's a great question. Um, my take on this, certainly in the corporate world, is it is key to have a governing objective. What are we here to do? And uh, the, the reason a governing objective is so important is because you have to think about, management is about trade-offs, and you're going to make trade-off decisions. And you just articulated a great example of a trade-off decision, right? So if our governing objective is to not make our fans uh, have unhappy Monday morning, maybe we punt and, and pray, right? But if our governing objective is we want to get the most wins possible and the decisions that lead to that, right? Now, most of the executives I talk to in the sports, they typically do say winning is really good because winning is what fills the stadiums and so on and so forth. Um, but that, you're absolutely right, is to be crystal clear about your governing objective. By the way, if your governing objective is winning, doesn't mean you don't take care of the community. It doesn't mean you don't take care of your, you know, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. But it has to be the ultimate way to, to judge those trade-offs. So you're, you're, that's a valid point. I totally agree with that. And I guess it's probably a little bit different for different organizations or different individuals. Right there, one more question. Great, yeah. <laughs> well, with using more analytics to kind of assess the skill, how do you account for the luck? Is there a way to account for luck using the analytics? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. This, there's a lot of work that's been done on this and there's a lot of stuff I talk about in the book. By the way, again, nothing I did in my book was original to me. I was I really uh, skimming off this incredible analytics community. But yeah, no, there absolutely, there's some, you know, for example, I'll give you one instance. Uh, there's a chapter, uh, chapter seven called What Makes for a Useful Statistic. And the idea is, you know, it's known in statistics is, you know, you want something that's reliable and valid, right? So reliable means that it, can, it correlates with itself over time, so high serial correlation. And high serial correlation typically is indicative of skill, right? And then you want it to be valid, which is say, if you do well with that metric or poorly with that metric, it serves the objective you're trying to, you're trying to achieve. So th that would be, for example, uh, and, and if, if, let's take a really trivial example for hitting statistics in baseball. There are different components of luck and skill in, in hitting statistics. So your strikeout rate is going to be much more skill indicative than your in-play singles and doubles rate. rate. So, so there, there, there are ways to measure those things, and uh, they should be carefully taken into consideration for sure. Well, if Michael's not going to do it, if you want to know more, buy his book, The <laughs> Success Equation. And uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks.